Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Jim Zogby. My next guest is Larry Johnson, a former intelligence officer with the CIA and a former deputy director in the United States State Department's Office of Counterterrorism. He's currently CEO of Berg Associates and expert on security and counterterrorism. Thanks for joining us. Um, when the announcements first came out of London and we saw the scenes of British uh, police running in and out, picking out people and the one car that exploded and the cars that were found and, and hauled away, that uh, lime green Mercedes. Uh, uh, many said, what a waste of a, of a real nice car. But in any case... Yuppie when, terrorists on when, the loose. <laughs> when, when that all, all happened, you, you got a lot of recognition, I think, for some of the comments you made uh, dismissing uh, the seriousness of this, saying this was at best amateurish and a waste of a good car. Uh, the question I have for you now is, have you changed your thinking over the last several days with some of the, 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 the further stories that have come out about this? No, not at all. Uh, because part of what I look at is the fact that on a daily basis in Baghdad, in Iraq, you have three or four of these kinds of incidents where people are actually being killed, where real high explosives are being used. Uh, I don't in any way doubt the intent of the individuals in terms of what they wanted mm -hmm. to try. But I think many times in the West, we have this problem of confusing desire and intent with capability. I want to win the publisher clearinghouse sweepstake. Just because I want to do it doesn't mean I'm going to. And what we saw in this case were, even though you had very educated people, they clearly did not know what they were doing. But my main criticism is lodged with the media. They were covering this 24-7 as if the cars had actually exploded and killed people. The fact that they didn't explode, no one died, and the only one who was really injured in the affair was one of the perpetrators when, he, when they set their car on fire at the Glasgow airport. I want to talk about some of the particulars of this and, and ask you about them. First is, um, early, early on, the British uh, said it was al-Qaeda linked. Um, a lot of questions then raised about was it homegrown and detached from this and very amateurish to be sure and copycat. Uh, and then these stories of Canon White, Brit an Anglican uh, priest, saying that in Jordan uh, he met a person from Iraq's uh, Al-Qaeda saying that uh, those that cure you will kill you. And he didn't quite understand it at the time, but in hindsight, reflecting on it, thinking maybe this is what he was talking about. Do you see an Al-Qaeda link here? Not really. And, and unfortunately, I think in the United States and in U.S. politics, Al-Qaeda has become shorthand for all terrorists. The reality, I think, what we're looking at is, and it's more accurately, would be called takfiri salafis. The takfiris who take it upon themselves within Islam to be the judges of all things that are proper within Islam, including their own ability to, de to condemn other Muslims, uh, coupled with this notion that they're somehow out there to restore the truth of Islam. What I see, just looking, you know, stepping back, we've got a billion plus Muslims in the world and the message of these takfiri Salafists is not resonating with 99%. So you don't think there was any direction here? As, was it copycat? I think it's doubtful. I think, I think this was, uh, copycat's probably part of it, uh, but I think it, it reflects this unique desire among people who consider themselves very devout and are going to decide to take action on their own. And it's, I think it's, it's more common among the young as opposed to the old, though you have people like Ayman Zawahiri, even though he's part of the Al-Qaeda leadership, I think what we need to be a, uh, a cautious about is declaring that Al-Qaeda is a hierarchical organization where people sign up or are recruited and they're, they're put together Karen in, in Young, a membership. In, Karen DeYoung in the Washington Post uh, says in an article on Tuesday, um, she said that the, there's a, an effort to see this as possibly a model for future attacks, i.e. attacks that do not take lots of casualties but create lots of panic and fear. Let's hope this is the model for the future because it's, it's Keystone Cops. I mean, these guys couldn't even get basically, they had gasoline with propane. The propane tanks ultimately, if they get hot enough, would explode, but they're not going to explode and create a blast wave that destroys the car and kills people within, you know, an immediate radius. It's just... Uh, so if this is the future, great. You know, we should have more of this. Talk to me about the types of the perpetrators that were involved here. These were doctors. This is quite different. What does this mean um, for 
police work in the future, homeland security work in the future, and civil liberties, because these are folks that we, they're here in the U.S., they're called J-1 visas, the, right. the guys who come over with specialized training. Um, are we going to have a whole new wave of people coming under a very different kind of scrutiny? I, look, I don't think these are the first doctors in the world that we've ever seen that have been involved with doing dastardly things. There was a guy named Dr. Joseph Mengele during the Nazi reign. Uh, there was a Dr. Baruch Goldstein in Israel who killed a bunch of Palestinians. There was a Dr. Che Guevara who some deify and others vilify, but who was involved with carrying out guerrilla activity. So I, I think what's unfortunate is what you're looking at here is a very small minority who have taken actions, and now unfortunately, Every J-1 visa holder who happens to be Muslim is now going to be a, a, a suspect. And I, and I think that is the real damage that's been done here. I want to get you out there in the conversation. If you're calling from overseas, call us at 001-202-842-5056. Here in the U.S., it's 1-800-528-2090. How serious do you think the London uh, bombings were? And what do you think it says about the future of attacks in the West? What does it say about attacks of the future in the West? We've seen lots of arrests here in the U.S. Some of them have turned out to be absolutely nothing. Actually, Some I, of them have turned out to be, we're never quite sure what they were going to be. I mean, I still haven't figured out the Fort Dix crowd. I'm not sure what I want to make of the Lackawanna group. I mean, uh, the paintball crew here in Northern Virginia, I've got my questions about that. In London, they did have, in fact, a, a, the subway attacks. They were quite uh, awful and, and deadly. But there have been so many others of these sweeps and arrests in different neighborhoods that panned out, turned out to be nothing at the end of the day. Um, this was a, a car that went into the Glasgow airport. They caught the two guys and through them they, they uh, you know, they, they, they pan, fanned out and, and caught a whole lot of other people. What do you think this says about where we're going? Are we going to see more copycasts? Is this, is this something that is, is going to inspire other people to try to get it right and do it better? I, I can't imagine any self-respecting jihadist who have watched the amateur performance of these guys and say, boy, I want to be just like them. Uh, the, the, the good news here, and, and, we, and we keep focusing upon the isolated incidents of terrorism, when you get outside of Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan, the incidence of international terrorism is very, very low. It's very infrequent. I'm not saying it's not a threat we should take mm -hmm. seriously, but I think the problem we have is we end up exaggerating the threat where it becomes all-encompassing. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, you can look at the numbers, the number of people worldwide that have died in international terrorist attacks, attacks involving people from two or more countries, since 1968 till today is fewer than 50,000. Now, it's, if, it's one, if you're one of the 50,000 or one of your loved ones, of course it's important. But we put that in the context of the loss of lives which occur in wars, whether it's the Vietnam War, World War II with 50 million dead. I just think we need to put things in its proper perspective and while it is true that what we're up against is this radical element of takfiri salafis, that we end up running the potential of demonizing all Muslims and all Arabs. And I, and I think that's the that's Let's the go to UK for a call. Call your question. Hello? Yes. Uh, good e yeah, hello. Good evening. Let me ask um, you a question yes. before you ask your question. Um, has there been a crackdown, uh, an observable crackdown that you're seeing in, uh, in UK right now? Uh, is the Muslim community um, feeling any panic? Well, this has been an ongoing thing for us since 9-11, so unfortunately it isn't anything uh, new for us. But just quickly, I just wanted to make a, a, a quick, uh, or ask a quick uh, question sure, to sure. your guest. Um, we were often told that Islamic fundamentalism was the preserve of the ignorant Muslim masses. But since 9-11, we've seen a, a demonization of Muslim pilots. And now, unfortunately, uh, Muslim doctors are going to be demonized. Uh, so what's going on here? Is there more than meets the eye? By the way, I'm a Muslim doctor. Okay, thank you. No, actually, I think what's been going on is that Hollywood and the film industry in general tends to portray the Islamic terrorists as the poor and impoverished, and more often than not, what we've seen you know, throughout history, it are the educated folks. So it is it's something, it, it is a combination, and it's not unique to Islam, but where a devout religious belief 
coupled with some skill can come together and make a pretty deadly mixture, but it's, it, but it's rare. Another call from UK caller. Oh, hello there. Um, I, as a doctor, I found it very distressing that doctors